What's up, kin folk? It's RJ Young. I am not on a step mill. Thank you for downloading, subscribing, watching the number one ranked show. We are on Instagram at the number one show. We're on Twitter at number one show. We're on Facebook. Where, wherever it is you want to consume us. One of the things I love about being digital first and one of the ways in which we are trying to give you what you are asking for. And in today's show, I'm going to talk about Quinn Ewers and Elite 11. going to reply to your vociferous and loud comments about my all-time top 10. And we're going to get into some, yeah, soccer of the national team variety and College football. Yes, I am going to pull that off. And since you are here, please consider subscribing and or rating where it is you are down listening to this podcast. Give a five-star review if you're on Apple. We are charging toward 100 ratings, and I am very excited about that. I think last time I checked, it was like 84. And, you know, I am not the least bit competitive. I'm lying to you. I want to have One of the most listened to shows, the best show in college football in the space. And you are a big reason as to how that happens and for whom I am doing the show, quite honestly. And to that end, let's talk about Elite 11. So I got a prediction. Five-star Quinn Ewers is going to win the most prestigious, prestigious, what is prestigious, recruiting competition in the sport for quarterbacks and will be called 2021 Elite 11 MVP when the competition concludes on July 3rd. And Ewers is not just any five star. He's one of the best ever five stars. He is only the sixth ever recruit and only the second ever quarterback to earn a 1.00 rating according to the composite player rankings. That's a lot of evers. The other five are Vince Young, Ernie Sims, Rashawn Gary, Jadavion Clowney, and Robert Kim Dietschy. Means that Ewers is rated higher coming out of high school than Trevor Lawrence, Justin Fields, Terrell Pryor, Adrian Peterson, Joe McKnight, Leonard Fournette, and current USC true freshman, Corey Foreman, among others. And all of those players, every last one of them, are ranked inside the top 20 players of all time in the recruiting rankings era. Ewers is from South Lake, Texas, and South Lake Carroll High School. He committed to Texas last summer, around about August, before decommitting, which is only a word in the world of college sports recruiting. It's the only one we have. I'm sorry. And flipping his commitment a couple of months later to Ohio State, where it seems his commitment is going to stick. He just took a visit there not too long ago. He finished his junior season in the 6A1 state title game, where he and the Dragons lost to fellow Elite 11 finalist Cade Klubnick and Austin Westlake. Klubnick is now a two-time state champion, as is Austin Westlake. Klubnik is committed to Clemson, for those of you that want to know. But Ewers' latest comments, being a Texas native and flipping his commitment, reflect a branding problem for Texas football programs, including not just UT, but Texas A&M. That won't get fixed until they can unseat Oklahoma or Alabama or LSU or Georgia, for that matter, if you're ampersand U. Reigning Big 12 champion Oklahoma is it. And then you got to, you know, do what OU has failed to do. Until this year, because it's going to happen this year, I believe, I believe that we will win a college football playoff national title. So 247 Sports asked viewers why he thought more highly regarded players weren't committing to Texas programs. He said, quote, probably because the Texas team hasn't been in the running for a national championship in a little while. And I don't know about other guys, but like me, I just want to compete at the highest level, the highest, highest level. End quote. He's right, you know. Texas hasn't played for a national title since 2009 when Ewers was five and hasn't won one since 2005. When Ewers was one, Ampersand U has won just one national title in its history in 1939 during a world war and more than 30 years before most predominantly white institutions integrated their football programs. You simply cannot ask a teenager to recall your glory years and your history as a means of recruitment. It's not incumbent upon them to know who you are, not when you're doing the recruiting. It's incumbent upon you to convince them that your program is the place to be. Now, Texas and Texas A&M aren't hurting in recruiting. They got receipts on the trail. Since 2018, the Longhorns have finished number 15 or better each year and peaked at number three. Ampersand U has finished number 17 or better 
in that same stretch of time. Though most of you would you know, know that they become the kind of program, both of them really, that we expect to finish among the top 10 in the team rankings annually, right? Both programs get exactly who they should get, but the receipts bear out differently in quarterback development, especially stacked against Ohio State. Buckeye coach Ryan Day has seen both of his quarterbacks that he has picked chosen to start for the Ohio State Buckeyes drafted in the first round, Dwayne Haskins and Fields. We could talk about Haskins being a bust later. The fact of the matter is he got drafted in the first round. Before Haskins was drafted, the Buckeyes hadn't seen a quarterback drafted in the first since Art Schleter in 1982. Todd, I've been practicing. Conversely, Ampersand, you hasn't seen a player draft in the first round at quarterback since 2014 when Cleveland took Johnny Manziel. Johnny Football, he of Texas Kill Country. We can talk about Bust and Johnny Manziel a little bit later. Ewers was 10 years old when Johnny Manziel got drafted. Texas hasn't seen a player drafted at quarterback in the first round since Vince Young in 2006. Ewers was two years old then. It's not a recruiting argument when you're, that we're discussing here, really. It's one of development. As in one in who is developing their recruits that they sign. So Garrett Wilson famously told Rivals as a recruit, he didn't choose Texas after finishing high school in Austin because, quote, I want to be developed. Yikes. And you know what? He has been at Ohio State, probably going to be a first-round pick. But the main reason Ewers is going to win Elite 11 MVP is based on Elite 11's valuation system anyway. The quarterback camp claims 50% of the Elite 11 staff evaluations comes from watching junior film and performances on the field. And then the other 50% comes from in-camp evaluations and traits. Traits include stuff we can't teach, like arm strength, height, weight, speed, and vision. But before we dispense with the Elite 11, like, say, the Heisman Trophy last week, consider it's a good indicator of who voters will pick to win the Heisman and which quarterbacks will be first-round picks. 12 of the last 14 Heisman winners are camp alumni, and the competition has a large enough sample size to be more than legit. In fact, Elite 11 has been around since 1999, almost as long as the Internet's recruiting rankings. And Ohio State has one winner in the last four years. And no, it's not Justin Fields. It's CJ Stroud. He is the player who exemplifies what the contest is supposed to be about. Rising through evaluation against other elite players. Not picking the player industry networks like the most to hedge your bets against how a player performs in college or professionally. Remember when I was talking about bust? This is where that matters. I'm pointing this out because it's the only part of the competition's evaluation the haters try to discount the most without pointing out how elite 11 evaluators get it right so often. Put down your hater eight for just a moment, peep this game, and take it back to the streets to put your homies on some. Stroud began 2019 ranked outside the top 500, I believe 838th in the country, and rode the elite 11 circuit to a top 40 ranking, winning elite 11 MVP. As a three-star recruit, he is the front runner to start at quarterback for the Buckeyes in September. And other Elite 11 Finals alumni include <gasps> Andrew Luck, Trevor Lawrence, Matt Stafford, Jameis Winston, Matt Liner, Geno Smith, Mark Sanchez, Tim Tebow, Vince Young, and Troy Smith, among many, many others. Brock Berlin, Matt Castle, I can keep throwing names at you. And that's where, you know, we talk about them, but that's also before we get to Haskins, Fields, Lawrence, Buckeye quarterback, Kyle McCord, Oklahoma quarterbacks, Spencer Rattler, and Caleb Williams, both, you know, Elite 11 MVPs. Lots of talent in that list of names, so it's not nothing to be an Elite 11 finalist is what I'm saying, let alone win Elite 11 MVP. For these quarterbacks, it's only just the beginning. Jump on the Quinn Ewers train. It's moving fast. All right. Now, let's get to the interview, which I conveniently forgot to tease at the start of my monologue. Pfft. Bruce Feldman. I love Bruce Feldman. He's going to answer some really important questions for me because, you know, nobody is a college football pope like Bruce Feldman. Let's go talk to Bruce. Bruce, how you doing? I'm doing good. Good to be on with you this morning. 
no, I appreciate this. This is a, this tremendous thrill for me. Um, you've always kept me informed about college football and have a tremendous bearing on my education in the sport. Um, and to that end, you're way out in front on the 35 breakout players for 2021. It's a great feature on The Athletic. And I picked out a few players that I'm most curious about. And I think the listeners of the show are most curious about. And at the top of the list, you know if you know it's about me, but you'll learn it. I'm an Oklahoma guy. I'm an Oklahoma fan. I see Mario Williams on the list. And I wanted to know, how does, how does a true freshman get on this list with that loaded wide receiver core? Yeah, I mean, part of it really is what some of the staff. So most most of this is kind of the intel I gather from talking to coaches and different guys at different programs. And I know a couple of people at OU. And you know, as you know, RJ, that the talent that they have had, obviously a quarterback, they've had a great one, but a receiver, they've really had a great run. You know, in the last seven eight years, and you know, they've recruited really well. So this guy is one of many. And, you know, last year we had Mims kind of break out um, as a young standout receiver. And I'm not saying Mario Williams is expected to be, to, to be overtake him as the number one guy. But what's interesting to me is you had Hollywood Brown, who was such a big play weapon for Lincoln Riley. Um, and here's a guy in Mario Williams who's 5'9", 180 ish or whatever. And the things I'd heard is super explosive, super quick. And I was like, is he a lot like Hollywood? And it was like, he's actually quicker than Hollywood, but probably not quite as fast, but still really fast. And the thing that, you know, somebody made the case is, is Lincoln Riley will make sure that he schemes things to get him the ball in space. Because when you have all these other weapons that they have on offense, um, it's pick your poison if you're a defensive coordinator. So the other thing that kind of like, I couldn't do this. Like, you know, I was asking coaches, give me somebody who you would say is your a guy to you'd buy stock in or breakout guy. And one of the guys on the OU staff was like, eh, I want to give you Spencer Rattler. I'm like, Spencer Rattler was a starter. We, you know, like <laughs> he's out there. People are hyping him up and everything. And this guy made the point. It was like, well, I just know this was around the time in the O in his, in his, uh, uh, Lincoln Riley slash OU education that Kyler made a huge jump and that's what they expect Spencer Rattler to make a huge jump they saw it in his decisiveness in his grasp and really understanding of of the system there as we said he's got the weapons so it sounds like a lot of people are already buying betting big on Spencer Rattler in part because of skill set but also I think be in part because football people, the people who cover it, and maybe the people who also evaluate it in, in NFL draft circles have seen the success Lincoln Riley's had with quarterbacks. And I think that adds to it. No, man, I'm here for it. Uh, that offense is, it's a Ferrari. It's a Mercedes. It's going to go. It's just about how good it's going to be. Um, another guy on this list that stuck out to me is Alabama tight end Jaleel Billingsley, who I remember being six foot four, 235, returning kicks. And now the only guy that I could think of is Keith Davis because, or Keith Jackson, not Keith Davis. Yeah. Keith Jackson, who also the legend was he's returning punts and trying to get his hands on the ball. Is that the kind of vein you see Jaleel Billingsley in? I think the, the thing that was interesting with Jaleel Billingsley and, and before the national title game, I did something where I talked to a lot of SEC coaches who played Alabama's offense and, and played Alabama in kind of a breakdown. It was, you know, obviously everybody heard about Devontae Smith. He was a phenomenal player. And then you had great running back. You had the best offensive line. You had Mac, Mac Jones. But you were talking to some people going, man, they got this X factor guy who's not really a tight end because he had a couple of more inline tight ends. But he's not Kyle Pitts, which is, you know, a whole nother level of hyperbole in terms of what he brings. But Billingsley is a really good weapon. Now, what I don't think we have a great feel for yet is one of the things I heard that was really kind of a spot on comment from one of the Alabama staffers was because I, I had asked him, what exactly do you think Sark did best as a play caller? Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that came up was because you would see stuff in games where they would, you know, motion and kind of is to get Devontae Smith especially uh, isolated and just put people in a bind. But this person made a point. It was like, you know, sometimes people, you, know, you get the keys to a car, to a fast car, and you drive at 79 miles an hour. 
He's like, Sark was driving at one, 150. <laughs> and this, like, we don't know exactly yet what Bill O'Brien is going to do. But, you know, Bill O'Brien, former college tight end, he has got a, a guy with a pretty unique skill set. And, you know, look, he's got John Mechie still there. John Mechie's a really dynamic athlete, too. Canadian uh, kid who really blossomed. People love him there. I don't think he's going to be exactly what, you know, they've had with all these other first round guys who pop through there, but they have enough other weapons around him. But it's like, how does Billingsley fit in this with like, you know, he's a four or five guy. He's got a lot of, you know, he's got the big catch radius. They can do a lot of stuff with him, Uh, you know, and Bryce Young is a more dynamic athlete playing quarterback. I'm not sure if there's going to be any drop off going from, Mac Jones to Bryce Young. I mean, he may be every bit as talented as anybody they've had play quarterback there in a long time. No, man, I'm excited to see what that offense looks like, especially with the addition of a Jai Hall and Brian Robinson finally gets to carry the load to say nothing of Roy Dell Williams and Jason McClellan. It's, it's really about can Bill O'Brien duplicate the success that Steve Sarkeesian was capable of at Alabama for me. Um, another dude on this list that, I know our listeners care a lot about is Ohio State wide receiver Jackson Smith in Jigba, who made a phenomenal catch last year. But also, my question is not so much why he's on the list. I think I know why he's one of those Xavier School for Gifted youngsters. It's is he going to have the opportunity to break out, knowing how balanced and even Ryan Day seems to want to be with that offensive attack? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, one of the guys I talked to inside Ohio State really thought that he has added so much polish to his game in terms of like, he was really smooth and they were excited about him last year, but you have Garrett Wilson, obviously you have Chris Olave. Those are first round picks out there and you're breaking in a new quarterback. Um, so how does, how does that kind of fit? Um, but the things that, that really impress people inside the program, which kind of popped for me and why I decided, you know, all right, I'm going to put him in the top 10 here and not just put him on the list was, they talked about his added physicality and one of the things which inside Ohio state, just from knowing some of the guys who've been through there is incredibly high praise was he is going to give us the physical presence on the outside. We really haven't had since Paris Campbell and Terry McLaurin. And that's a big mouthful in terms of like what they asked. Like, I think, I think um, Brian Hartline is one of the best uh, position coaches in college football. I mean, he's really, you know, he's, I don't want to say he's made his bones as a recruiter because then it's not fair to what he's done for the players when they're actually on the field. But I think some of the things that he has brought to them and to the detail work has been really interesting and really um, a big added value for, for that program and certainly Ryan day. And so to see now what Jackson can do second year in the program, he's had really a full off season with Mickey Marotti in the strength program they said he's kind of changed his body, um, much stronger, much more physical. I think that is going to benefit them in a lot of ways because there's going to be so much attention on those two other receivers that I think this guy could be the one who kind of ends up having a sneaky big year. No, man, I'm here for it. Um, I think you wrote a profile of Brian Hartline not too long mm-hmm. ago, right? Yeah. right? Okay. Um, but yeah, like when you look at the receipts, like it's not just Smith and Jigba or Chris and Lave or Garrett Wilson. It's also... Emeka Egbuka, number one in 2021 at wide receiver. It's also Julian Fleming, number one in 2020 at wide receiver. Like he's, I, I have some real fears about some of those dudes getting onto the field because they're so good and they're so deep there. But as you pointed out, he's done a tremendous job at developing them. And that doesn't get enough praise as well. Um, I want to change gears here for a little bit because we're coming up on the inaction of name, image, and likeness legislation at the state level, right? And I love this quote that you were given. Uh, In a normal recruiting cycle and altered by a pandemic, Ohio State host, or or, no, you wrote this, you didn't give this quote. Ohio State host uh, about 50 official visitors this month. Has there been any conversation about what name, image, and likeness is going to be like for them or anybody else as we get closer to kids being able to sign deals? Yeah, there's been a ton of chatter, RJ. I think what's really tricky is people still do not know the way it's going to really operate, right? And so schools can – I had this conversation with a student athlete in the Pac-12 last night 
who I would say is one of the more intelligent people I know. And I wanted to hear it from his perspective as a 20 year old who's got, you know, who knows how not just um, football works in terms of from the inside, but also knows the other, the rest of the athletic department. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and I know this isn't quite your question, but like, just as somebody who's covering it is a lot of times, especially, you know, me being, having covered college football for a long time, just being older, you end up with like a little bit of a warped view of what maybe the reality is because college football is the thing that has always brought the most money, right? You know, you know, we, I loved college basketball, but college basketball doesn't, you know, it's relative to compared to college football. College football is the thing that brings in all the money, right? So, but one thing that has started to kind of come up a lot, and it came up quite a bit with my conversation with this Pac-12 athlete uh, yesterday was uh, female athletes have a big opportunity to really benefit from it. You know, we're talking about gymnasts, we're talking about track and field athletes, we're talking about like female soccer players, maybe softball players. And what was made an interesting point was, you know, these athletes, they may not have like, there's no NFL. I mean, there, yeah, there's a WNBA. Yeah, there are some leagues. But if you're a gymnast, um, you may have a big opportunity in college to benefit, right? And so one of the things we talked about yesterday was, okay, how do you like, are people saying to you, if you're a, not, if you're a recruit, if you're already in the program, uh, are we specifically looking at a specific marketing plan for you? Like I'll use you as an example, like let's pretend, you know, you, you're the, you're the player at Oklahoma state or RJ, you are from Tulsa. You are, you know, like here's the landscape of your, your fingerprint being like, okay, RJ lives in this area. He grew up in this area. These are the attributes and these are the people we can target to. And I was curious, cause that is like, if you, one thing you hear a decent amount in the last few years, if you talk to strength and conditioning coaches is they will put together like a specific plan for Johnny Smith or, or this kid that's really t- catered towards, you know, what they've defined for him, you know, strengths and weaknesses. You know, our school is going to do that for 120 football players are going to do that for all their athletes in the program because that is pretty intensive to do. Um, And those conversations that are had, I feel like they are showing recruits something to, to kind of wet their whistle a little bit. But I don't know if they can drill down deep enough because right now, like this thing is, you know, bouncing around Congress there's, I don't want to say it's waning support, but it's like, it's hard to get a great read on exactly what it's going to look like, even though, you know, it's whatever, June 17th, and we're not that far from July one, you know, that's the part, like, if you're a football player like this, this athlete was telling me, you know, it's like, does that mean I'm going to hold camps in the area where I'm from? And maybe I charge $25, per kid for a day camp. And maybe that turns out to be $2,500 or maybe $5,000. You know, it depends. And they don't, I don't think they really know what it looks like yet. I mean, and that's, that's part of the challenge of what are we, what is, what is happening here? I do know um, one of the things that came up a lot for in the past year was a lot of head coaches, maybe cynically looking at going, Ooh, this is going to, screw up college football as we know it. And because the it, it'll mess up the power dynamic within the, or, or locker room chemistry or who knows what. And those, those, those conversations are definitely being had. And um, I don't know, you know, you have all kinds of opportunities here. I am fascinated to see how it's going to actually play out and how, which schools are going to be able to benefit and how States are going to handle it because you see some States with some what feels like potentially very restrictive um, writing of how the handling it, but that doesn't mean actually those schools are going to, you know, take advantage of those, that language necessarily. Yeah. Georgia being a prime example of that. I, I looked at this and I said, you didn't read this before you guys submitted it. Did you, somebody did this for you because there's some problems in here that I know that Georgia has already said, we're going to, we're not going to do that part of the, 
legislation. But well, RJ, I think I think what you know is a good point. Like it's like when you say Georgia, maybe we're talking about the politicians. Mm -hmm. When you and I talk Georgia, it's we're thinking of Kirby Smart's Georgia, and so I think. You know, I, I think UGA's leadership, especially as it relates to football, is probably going to be really sensitive to go, ooh, if this is so restrictive on the student athlete, this can be used against us in recruiting because if Alabama or Florida or Clemson is not going to operate the same way and it's going to burn us in recruiting, we're going to, you know, I don't say we're going to give the middle finger to the politicians in that state, but, you know, like, hey, you're not doing us any favors here. No, I, I had an SEC coach tell me if there's nothing that is done in his state, he's going to the Capitol to, to raise hell because this is going to be used against him in that way because that's what he would do. He said that would be the smart play. I also thought it was interesting you, you bring up the female athlete because I was I just ordered a Odyssey Alexander jersey. Okay, I'm an Oklahoma fan. But the way that she performed in the Women's College World Series with the stakes on the line, carrying that team the way she did, I thought was inspiring. And yeah, the, I, dive, the diving tag at home plate. Right, right. Yeah. I mean, and I'm the guy with the Maya Moore jersey on, right? So I'm, I'm looking for these stories and I'm looking for these women. And I would, I, I'm looking over, she's got 71,000 followers on Instagram. Her, her Twitter following quintupled since she started the Women's College World Series. And what she might have been able to do just before she goes into USSA pride to play professional fast pitch. So lots of stuff going on there. I'm also interested to see how this is going to affect uh, social media, particularly on YouTube where I'm fluent and I, I see kids are popping up talking about transferring, right? And what that process is like going to the portal, those sorts of things. So I'm with you. I'm interested to see what happens and how this thing plays out because it, for me, it's kind of like watching the red shirt rule or the transfer portal. We had an idea and we were right some of the time, but not enough. Right. And we still are seeing how that is affecting us um, to the to recruiting, though, specifically in this month with the number of visits and the number of high profile visits that are going on. What is your overall takeaway with how we are handling? And by we, I mean the industry and the coaches and the players, this unprecedented boom in recruiting after 16 months of a dead period. The right now from, from everything I've heard from coaches and I'm talking to a lot of guys who are at these camps at way off their campuses, right now out here uh, this week, you have coaches who are going to a, a big camp at Sacramento state. Uh, then there's a camp at Fresno state. I think you see a lot of, you know, the same coaches kind of cycling around and then they have to go back to their campuses because, you know, maybe, some kids are going to take unofficial visits or maybe, and one of the things that was really interesting, and I don't know, it's still a little too early to get a read on it, but like you have kind of a one-off in these one-on-one -on -one evaluations that, that you're able to do for an hour. You, they are not, um, you can't have like analysts do it. It can only be uh, position coaches. So if you're a staff with, you know, 40 guys on staff, you can't have 40 different kids operating it, you know, like it's, it's not geared towards that, but it's like they can't use a ball. There's certain things. And I think, you know, it, it seems to be like they're getting a feel for what is going on as it's going on. Like I have a story that I'm going to do later this month on a top uh, 2023 player and his kind of tour, how he's managed it, um, you know, the finances of it, because you have to pay your own way. Yeah. Um there's a lot there because as you know, the timing is all jacked up now from what it normally is. Right. And so what is really curious to me is this is going to be really hard evaluation for college coaches because yeah, they can watch the film, but they so much is like eyeballing kids and seeing what they do. Also seeing how they, how normally what, how they take coaching in their drills, specifically in camps. And a lot of times kids aren't, they may be showing up, but they not may not they may not be showing up to work out. Um, and so, what's an offer? Do you have an offer to go to camp, or do you have an offer that's a scholarship offer? It's yeah. very murky. And the story I did on the athletic at the beginning of the month, one of the things that I could not stress enough, even to my editors, about was that com combination with lo like looming NIL, but really with the portal 
And if you're going to take, like we're talking about Oklahoma before, Oklahoma has, you know, one of the best, one of you know, the top guy on our impact transfer list is a running back from Tennessee. Now I talk to guys who used to coach at Tennessee and guys who do coach at Oklahoma. And I know why, you know, they're really excited about it. And then there's an offensive lineman who was a big recruit. And we'll see how that works out in college uh, at OU. And then there's a defensive back who's a, you know, still developing player, but it's like, all right, you can't take as many transfers. Now it may seem like certain schools. I feel like every week USC seems to be gobbling up another <laughs> transfer, right? And where are they fitting guys and how do you manage it? But it's like, okay, you're doing that. But at some point it's going to come at the expense of how many guys you can take who are high school players. And when the evaluation may not, may be a little murkier than normal, just because of you haven't had a chance to, to see guys that creates a really interesting dynamic. How do schools manage it? Because a lot of times if you're taking transfers, you better hope that they are ready to come in and play as opposed to some developmental offensive lineman who may not do anything for you for three years. No, and that is an extremely good point in reference to roster management. Uh, Eric Gray, Wanya Morris, and Key Lawrence joining up from Tennessee, volunteering, as it were, in my dad joke, to go into the transfer portal, come out at, at Oklahoma. But I'm also... Like to your point about what are you going to give up in the future that you might not be able to get and how many spots do you leave open for transfers as opposed to guys that you know you want to go get and develop. I'm, I'm really interested in this and USC seems to have a handle on it in a way that I didn't think that they were capable of even a year ago with three dudes that I can think of off the top of my head from Texas, you know, let alone whomever else they're going to be able to get to help them. Like I think they got two running backs in the past yeah, Darwin mm -hmm. Barlow from TCU and Keontae Ingram. Ingram from Texas, who came right. earlier. You know, they had one of my crew, my old Fox TV crew. We did some CU games and uh, LaVisca's best friend is this really dynamic receiver. His hands are, are probably not they're not great. They're they're good. But he's like um, lights the room up when he comes in. Right. And I was like, I remember telling somebody at USC like you guys are going to love this guy in terms of like, we talked about name, image, and likeness. And like, you know, obviously USC has a lot of opportunities mm -hmm. and like Katie Nixon, who's another Texas native, I think he's from DeSoto, but like just all sorts of like, he wants to be like, I think he wants to be an actor or wants to be, you know, something. And it's like, I totally get why, you know, if you're USC, like USC and Miami have, have been very active in taking transfers, especially in the last few years. And they're both obviously unique in that they're big city, kind of glamorous places in terms of, you know, the environment. Um, and it's attractive, especially for second chances. I mean, we're talking to OU, you know, Charleston Rambo is a guy who created some buzz for them this spring. Right. So um, it's really like, it's, it's um, how programs kind of leverage what they can sell and who they, who they bring in. Um, it's fascinating to see how that that marketing play goes out, especially like, look, there's no secret. Clay Helton's been kind of on the hot seat for a while. They had a really bad recruiting class, a lowly ranked recruiting class two years ago. And now they've ramped up and, um, you know, they're going to be they're going to be fascinating to see how it plays out in 2021. Nice pull from you with Katie Nixon. Uh, Clay Helton actually mentioned him on on the show last month when I was asking him about these guys that he's able to go get. And also going from ranked outside the top 60, dead last in the Pac-12, to not just number seven, but securing the commitment of a dude that was committed to Clemson, who never sees decommitments, right? And then becomes what we know of as one of the top 20, according to the recruiting rankings, players of all time. It feels like USC is getting back to being what they were when Pete Carroll had them running, but I'm, I know I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I just, I want to live in a world where USC, Nebraska, Arkansas and others are good as opposed to talking about what they could be. Um, another question I had for you that goes to, well, another part of your career, you've written these books, you've co-written these books. Um, they're all on my shelf from meat market to swing your sword to Kane mutiny to the latest flip the script, how Ed Orgeron turned LSU around and won a 2019 national championship. But a story that I kept and I really loved from that book is how Ed Orgeron recruited Joe Burrow. And I'm not really talking about the cat, uh, the crawfish that he sent out to have brought in. It's more him checking on what's Joe going to do? Because as I understand it, it was LSU in Cincinnati is what he was looking at. And he wanted to get a definitive 
from his brother. Is that, do I have that right? You do. So really Joe Burrow is an Ohio kid. It wasn't working out at Ohio state. Um, a bunch of guys who are, uh, assistants and staffers from Ohio state had joined Luke fickle staff. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joe's girlfriend at the time, I think is from Cincinnati. She had graduated at Ohio state, like he had graduated. And, um, that would have been probably easy for him. And so they, uh, LSU felt like they were the long shot, even though they're the you know bigger name program. And so Ogeron, as he has always been, will try to like, to find who in the family do I have the relationship with? And so Jimmy Burrow, Joe's dad is a longtime college assistant coach and Joe's mom were coming, but one of Joe's older brothers, Dan was coming on the trip and Dan is play, was a walk on at Nebraska. And so Dan, you know, is telling me the story. He's like, yeah, I get there. I'm the first one to get there. And he goes, I was all fired up to meet him because he is, he told some great story on my favorite podcast, pardon my take. And he was like, so now I'm like, you know, like, it's almost like he had a man crush on Ed Ogeron mm. and Ogeron's like, you know, got this where he's just kind of feeling it and everything. And they have this um, meeting with most with a bunch of their staff and basically watching Ohio state film and cut ups of Joe as well as LSU stuff. And Ogeron kind of realized pretty early on, he was like, Joe Burrow is the smartest one in this room football wise. And the crazy thing is you have guys who coached in the NFL in that room. You have guys who coached in college football for a long time. And he's just listening to how Joe Burrow um, is explaining things and the command he has. And they're blown away by it. He's like, we got to get this guy. And so He's not sure because Joe Burrow's not like he was like, usually in recruiting, you can kind of feel the guy you connect with. And that really wasn't Joe. And so um, Foster Moreau, who was a good tight end for them, is now in the NFL um, was somebody that I think, you know, has a Ed Ogeron has a lot of affinity for. And so Foster was his host and kind of was like, no, he's telling me he's, you know, he liked it. And like, but so a couple of days after the visit, Ed's calling Dan, the, uh, the older brother. And he's like, and Dan wants him to go to LSU. The parents want him to go to LSU. And one of the points Dan made is like, you know, if you're in Ohio and you go to Cincinnati as the Ohio state Buckeye, they're always going to like, that question is going to keep coming up. You go to LSU, it's a different deal. And you have the, you know, it's way more upside towards that. It's like betting on yourself, mm -hmm. but Ed is like, you know, he's hearing Dan and Dan's not trying to tell Joe Burrow. He doesn't want him to tell him what he thinks he should do. Mm -hmm. And at one point it was like, Dan, and I'm not going to imitate Ogeron's voice, but he was like, I want you to reach down, check your package. If you got two, he goes, I want, and then he goes, basically gives him instructions of what he should say. <laughs> and Dan Burrow has got like a spreadsheet of like things that like how he's going to explain a PowerPoint of like how he's going to explain this. And in the end, um, he didn't need to do all that. I think in terms of like to sell his brother, because I think his brother was already there with the decision, but it was just like kind of fascinating thought process of like, you know, it seemed like, like for a lot of people, like, that is a very Ed Ogeron story. And that is like the dynamic of like, okay, I am going to, um, I'm going to recruit the family and I'm going to recruit the brother and I'm going to sell them. And so like what I thought to kind of go full circle with it, Joe Burrow wins the Heisman and you see, I don't want to say Joe Burrow is like, especially stoic, you know, by nature, but like, I mean, he was like the term a coach on the field is way overused, but he was probably as close to a coach on the field in college football as you're going to get. Um, because he came in there, he was older, he had, you know, a coach's kid, he brought some things with him. They, they, you know, Ed and the offensive staff leaned on him in ways that you usually don't lean on a college quarterback in aspects. And so when Joe Burrow got really emotional talking about his relationship with Ogeron, you know, he's like breaking up. Um, a lot of that I think was really for the, Hey, we're, I'm going to bet on myself. I know you're betting on me and all those things. And so it was a lot like catching lightning in a bottle where 
you know, like Joe Burrow, Joe Brady was a really good assistant uh, coach and, a, you know, really great addition. Um, obviously, the receivers with Jamar Chase and Justin Jefferson and, and Clyde was, you know, it was like a lot of things all came together at that point. And the ironic thing is LSU had a commitment from Patrick Sertan, who was the number one cornerback in the country. If they get him, I don't think they have room for Joe Burrow. Oh, wow. So... It's um, it's fascinating how this stuff sometimes works out. No, man, that that in and of itself I got to talk with Pat Sertan on the show and I asked him about that. And because his father had been in a back and forth about this uh, and then ends up at Alabama. But that, I think, m- would make most LSU fans feel a lot better about not getting one Pat Sertan the second to play at LSU. But I also really enjoy that. Joe Burrow is coach on the field as, as you understand it, because, you know, in reading that book, right. I also get to know that that's Devin White's team in 2018 and he's waiting on a quarterback to take it from him. Not necessarily, you know, he's given it up, but he wanted somebody that was going to challenge them in practice the way that he would challenge the offense in practice. And we all know Devin White's one of those guys now that has a college football national championship and a Super Bowl ring, and he would be effusive in his praise of Joe Burrow. And that was when I was put on game as to who Joe Burrow is, because I had tremendous respect for one Devin White. Um, And there's, and look, I can't use this language. I don't think on your podcast, but before Joe really took over as the quarterback, as the guy, one of the things was, you know, we have a great story and flip the script about um, Devin is wearing him out. This play is not going to work everything. And it was like out of nowhere or seemingly out of nowhere, Joe Burrow, Devin you know, I'm going to go beat the F out of you. And it was like, whoa, where did that come from? And then like after his first year starting Patrick queen, who eventually, you know, became a star linebacker in a first round pick for the Ravens, they get into a fight. And it's like, there's a couple of fights that are happening. And I think like, as you said, LSU had it had always been defined by its defense and this was the first time they'd ever seen the offense fight and push like that, at least in a long time. And I'm not saying they, they obviously had great offensive players with Fournette and, and Odell Beckham Jr. and Jarvis Landry and a bunch of other dudes over the years. But in terms of the leadership and take it on, I mean, like I would tell people, you know, like, yeah, the book is a book about here's Ed Ogeron's life full circle from losing everything, battling alcoholism and substance for a long time. You know, if you are a football fan, like I would say like the Joe Burrow stuff to me that I was around for that year, especially late in the year and sitting in a meeting, it just was like, all right, I am sold like on the Cincinnati Bengals. Now, if he gets, if, if injuries happen, like they obviously did, that's, you know, it's a d- different story, but like, the stuff I saw in tangibles wise, the stuff I saw in how he processes, even athletically, he's a way better athlete than I think a lot of people probably give him credit for. Um, just like he was the wow guy to me. And it's not, it's not a knock on anybody else. Cause I thought, you know, like I would sit in a running backs meeting next to Clyde and I'm looking over and Clyde's got a page full of notes. Right. And there's another guy over there who's like dozing off and there's, you know, but it was like, all right, I get, I get Clyde, you know, in terms of after sitting in that meeting, one of the reasons why Kevin Falk, who was not the running back coach at the time, but like is now was in the program, obviously a Super Bowl guy with the Patriots was so effusive on Clyde's going to be special this year and just the preparation. And so, you know, you'd see Jamar chase and you'd see, um, you know, it, it was like a fascinating dynamic to watch that team because as a sideline reporter, I'm on the field before, you know, games right before kickoff. And I was on the field right before they played Georgia in the SEC championship. And the team that I saw like 15 minutes before kickoff was exactly the same temperament and attitude and loose and confident and focused, which is a weird you know, three things to kind of combine at the same time for college kids is the same way they were at Wednesday practice. Mm. Right. And so, and a lot of that, you know, was a lot of factors coming together. No, man, that's, it's fascinating team. And the more I learned about it, the the more I came to like them. Uh, The last question I had for you before I let you go is for an early preview of my favorite column you write every year. 
It's called the freak list. For those of y'all that don't know, and I don't know why you're listening to the show if you don't know about it, but are there guys that you've already been like, nope, he's going in? Oh, yeah. I mean, I started working on this um, like ramped up probably in the last month. Mm. And normally we do it in July this year. I think they're going to run it in August. And there are like this is like I'm more excited about this one than I've been in a while because there are some things like I, I sent back a message to one of the coaches. I was like, you said this 40 time. Is that a typo? You know, it was like, you know, yes. it was like and then the person just wrote back five letters laser, meaning like laser time. I was like, uh, OK, you know, I've got some stuff like I have a small school guy that I was like, I should do a story on this where it's like some strength coach. I, you know, at a school I'd never heard of or maybe I, I didn't realize they still had football reached out to me about a guy that he has. And I was like, man, this is a guy I should do a story on separately just about this particular player. And so you start hearing it now. I've What has happened a lot is I get players reach out you know, directly. Um, and I was like, all right, well, this one particular player, he's at a place where like their schools already said, yeah, we got these two defensive backs or a defensive back and a, um, no, two defensive backs. And I was like, yeah, but I got this edge rusher. who's like, who got like, I got other verified numbers that are like, you know, that are pretty strong too. And so, it's a fun thing to work on because what you get sometimes is some of these bigger schools will be like, well, how good does the player actually have to be? And I'm like, I will, if there, if he's just a freak athlete and maybe he's, you know, a situation, a special teams guy, that's fine. You know, I don't need them. You know, Saquon Barkley was once number one. Saquon Barkley was obviously a, a, a ridiculously talented football player and an incredible athlete. I mean, it's great if it's that, but there's also been, I had Marcus Hunt number one, one year, who was a, you know, a former Estonian shot putter from, you know, ended up at SMU who's been in the NFL for a long time, but would put up ridiculous numbers. And the the thing I, you know, one of the things that's been really fun about that, about this piece over the years is early on, and it doesn't happen much anymore, but it used to happen the first maybe five years I did it at ESPN with people like those numbers aren't, you know, like that's just hype or whatever. Well, you know what happens is these guys go to the combine and they put those numbers like Marcus Hunt's numbers are almost identical to what we had in the story. Um, Tristan Wirfs, a couple of years ago from Iowa, put up ridiculous numbers. Now, occasionally there will be a guy, Byron Jones from the Cowboys, who is a UConn guy who like broad jumped like from the three point line, essentially, like there will be that guy where I'm like, man, nobody told me about him or, you know, something. But then, um, you know, maybe maybe it doesn't line up or whatever, but it's fun when you see these guys who actually, you know, even top their numbers a year later or two years later at the combine. No, man, like it's become one of my favorite things, not because I'm looking to check the math, but because I learned something about their athletic history that I didn't know before. Um, and then they get to, to show out later on, like Neville Gallimore, I want to say was on this list yeah. three times, maybe, maybe twice, maybe three times. At anyway, least twice. Yeah. Right. And then he dropped what he dropped in the 40 and everybody's like, where did this come from? Be like, he, Bruce has been telling you about this dude for years. Like he's squatting 800 pounds. Like, what do you, what do you mean? Where did he come from? On him. So this might've been the Mahomes Baker game. Like it was in Lubbock, whatever it was. So my crew did that. And so as a sideline reporter, a lot of times I would have a lot of stuff just in case. Right. And so Neville Gallimore is Canadian. He had, I remember talking to Bob Stoops had said, yeah, like it was like he went up there on a blizzard or something like I think, you know, to, to do his home visit. But the guy who coached him and I'm blanking on his name was a former I want to say it was a former NFL player who played at Cal. But like they talked about volleyball, soccer background and everything. And the numbers were like, seriously. And then, <laughs> um, you know, you talk to, uh, you know, Benny Wiley, who I've known for years, who's a strength coach at OU, used to be, you know, was with Leach at Texas Tech. And I remember I asked Lincoln, he was like, if I didn't see it with my own eyes, I wouldn't have believed it. You know, like it's those kinds of things where the numbers are insane. And like you said, then they do it in Indy. Um, and those guys are, you know, the defensive linemen actually are the ones who are like the most, wow, you know, where it's like that guy's that big and he's doing that or, or whatnot. I mean, I have some guys like now, like there's a school that's like a group of five and 
the the athletes they have and i was just like and i'll i'll like kind of cross check with jim nagy who is a former nfl scout who runs a senior bowl or daniel jeremiah and i'm like hey have you heard about this guy or whatever and it's like no i'm not into you know maybe sometimes daniel might not be in you know might not have watched that guy's film yet or jim is on top of a lot of stuff with small school guys spencer brown from northern iowa robert rochelle who's now out here with the rams like like I have bookmarked That's video. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. I have book a bookmark something of like Robert Rochelle sitting in like a weight room coming out of like what looks like a, 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 a desk chair, like just in slow motion hits the ground and it's like jumps, you know, five feet, you know, you know, like box jumps out of there. And it's just, you know, some of these things you see and, and um, you know, like, I don't know. I've always loved those kinds of freaky aspects of it. I mean, there was video I used to have on my computer years ago on an old computer of a player at Troy. And all you see, Troy had this punter who looked like a redheaded Santa Claus. I don't remember <laughs> his name. This is probably like 12 years ago. And he's just standing there. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, you see somebody in like the postage stamp size video, if you, you remember what it used to look like on computers 10 years ago. This guy just runs and jumps over him, like comes out of nowhere because he's smaller and jumps over their punter, like just in the weight room. And I was like, this is awesome. Like, and, you know, like sometimes now you get some of those videos. I'd love to have more of them, um, you know, but that's that's the fun part of this. I mean, I, I and it, I'm grateful for the schools who now now that they've seen it enough, like a lot of times schools that used to you know, I would have to like call, like, you know, kind of go behind them, not go behind, but yeah, like go talk to assistant coaches and go, Hey, give me a guy from your school. Cause I know you got them. Now a lot of those, some of those same schools are like, they're offering up guys and, wow. and they're, they're on board. And yeah, like I hear from so many people in the NFL, I can't tell you how many times I would go to a game and the NFL scouts are on the field before the games, same as a sideline reporter. And somebody would go, yeah, you had this guy or whatever. And it's just, yeah, it's, that is, I don't want to call it a labor of love because it's not labor, but it's just like, it's, it is the funnest project I work on all year. It's, it's been that. No, man, I am, I'm always looking forward to it. Uh, I came up at Tulsa studying exercise science and English thinking I was going to be a strength coach, like got them CSCS, all of it. So when, when you write about this stuff, I feel like it is for me. I'm in the gym. I'm watching these you know, Omega level mutants do this stuff and it's going, what are you, what are we doing here? These guys play football. What, what do you mean that guy's squatting that he's jumping that? No, it's one of my favorite things that you do. And I'm grateful for it. I'm also grateful for you. Uh, again, I can't tell you what a thrill this is for me as a guy who loves the sport, who has read about the sport every day since I was a child. Um, and the books that you have written, the stories that you have told, I'm so grateful for you and being able to, to talk with you about this stuff. And I hope I get to talk to you again sometime down the line, but I know you're also extremely busy. Also, you should know, if you don't already, Bruce is on Big Noon Kickoff as Fox College Football's insider when he is not writing for The Athletic, and you can catch him on the sidelines. Um, really offered up some outstanding tidbits, some outstanding anecdotes, and is always making me smarter about the sport. Thank you so much, Bruce. Thank you, RJ. I really appreciate it. It's a good conversation, and I, I like I said, it's – um. I feel very fortunate to be able to cover a sport I love. And I, I, it's one of those things where I love it even more now than I probably did 20 years ago. And that's saying something just because you feel a connection to places and you see, you know, being able to go on the road and go to games and, you know, you're, you're around people who love it and they, it's the most important sport to them. It's not to say they don't love other things, but that's been really awesome to be, you know, be a part of. And I'm, I'm very appreciative for that. Um, Bruce, we will talk to you, hopefully, down the line. Awesome. Thanks. So Bruce is awesome for all the reasons that you know about and awesome to do this interview, especially on short notice. I'm so grateful for that. But now I want to do some summer content. I want to do some really cool stuff because, you know, the pandemic happened and everything sucked during the pandemic, not the least of which is a lot of our favorite competitions were delayed by a year, like the Olympics, but also... Euro 2020 is going on in 2021 and Copa America, which is supposed to go on in 2020 is going on in 2021 and the African cup of nations, which is supposed to go on in 2020 is going on in 2021 and the gold cup and on it goes in addition to the Olympics. So I got on the Twitters watching a bunch of soccer because I really love the sport 
and was looking at some of these rosters and was looking at some of the history and looking at some of the players. And I came up with some comparisons for college football programs and national teams, right? And I had too much fun with this. I brought this to producer cat. Producer cat was like, no, I like that. So we're doing it, which I'm so grateful for. All right. So let's start with the first team that I thought of and the first program that I thought of. And that is England as Texas. Like college football fans look at England and see Texas. Why? Because most college football fans that watch soccer watch a lot of English Premier League soccer, right? So we're very familiar with Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal, Manchester United, Manchester City. We can even take it all the way down to Stoke if we want to and Aston Villa and West Ham. But we know all those dudes and we know that all those dudes are good. And we know that all those dudes together should be winning titles. Texas, hello? Like, that is what we think of. We're looking at you going, how is it that you have Harry Kane with the captain's armband who's scoring like a million goals every year and you can't win a title? How is it you have Raheem Sterling, Jordan Pickford, my goodness, my son, Mason Mount. Like, how is it you have all these dudes and you can't be bothered to go win more than one World Cup since 1966 when you hosted the doggone tournament, all right? Like, that's how we feel about Texas. Because if you look at Texas and you see they've won exactly one national championship since integration, and you see they have four total, you're like, how is it they keep having these dudes and not winning titles? Earl Campbell, anybody? Ricky Williams, anybody? Colt McCoy, anybody? Like, the more we keep going, anybody, the more you get the idea here, right? So that's England and Texas. The next one, college football fans look at the Netherlands and see Michigan, okay? And this is more me talking well about Michigan, not necessarily what Michigan has been in the last few years, though Michigan in the last few years has been good, right? We just don't think of them as being good because they haven't managed to beat Ohio State in 10 years. But that actually hides how good they have been. And this is true of the Netherlands, because when you look around and you see some of the dudes that have come through the Dutch, you've been like, my goodness, no wonder they are there more often than not. And then somehow will fail to make a tournament, right? It's like Michigan, you are getting in the Citrus Bowl playing Alabama, right? You are right there at the end. You're winning nine, 10 games. And then you have a dud like last year where you're going into triple overtime to beat Rutgers and you got to bow out of the game and you were this close to seeing your head coach fired. So I looked at the Dutch and I seen Michigan, which is to say that when they're on, they're going to be absolutely awesome. When they are off, they're going to be absolutely the worst. And you're going to look at that team. You're going to look at that program and go, you have no excuse not to be good. That's how we feel about the Dutch. That's how we feel about Michigan. So we'll see what the Netherlands can do in the Euros. College football fans, look at Italy and see Wisconsin. Okay, so this one, I actually go into the weeds a little bit. So as a rule, the Azuri is not here for your total football, right? It doesn't care to have dudes from the back that can initiate the attack and have dudes that can interchange and play the little triangle football and play Pep Guardiola ball, right? To say nothing of Johan Cruyff. It's not here for that. And they got away from that and it bit them. So Giorgio Cellini, basically is yelling this. He's a defender, and he is perhaps the talisman of that team. His quote is, now everyone is looking to push up. Defenders know how to set the tone and play, and they can spread the ball, but they don't know how to mark. Nowadays, from crosses, Italian defenders, and I can only talk about Italian defenders, I'm only relatively interested in foreign players, don't mark their man. It's a great pity because we're losing our DNA a bit and some of those characteristics which had us excel in the world. He's not wrong. When Italy's winning World Cups, you cannot score. It is a fortress, okay? Like, you can talk about what they might lack in the final third. You might talk about their lack of attacking potential or playmakers, but you would not say that a good Italian team is one for which is giving up goals. It's just not what they're doing especially when they had Gigi Buffoon back there. Like, they were just getting it done in that way. I look at Wisconsin, I see the same thing, okay? When Wisconsin is good, they run the ball and play defense, okay? 
Before Baker Mayfield, Jim Leonard's probably the greatest walk-on ever. And that man was a do-everything safety. And when you look at that team, they had great linebackers, they have great defensive line, and they have good cover corners. You're going to have a hard time scoring on them, and it's going to be a low-scoring game if they're going to be good. Okay? You're going to have your bell cow back. This year it's probably going to be Jalen Berger. It was Jonathan Taylor in the past. And you're going to play keep away and get the ball back and play keep away again. That is what Italy does very well. Okay. College football fans, look at Belgium and see Clemson. All right. So I got to walk this one out to you. There are just over like 11 million people who live in Belgium. And it's in three what are called federal districts. In Flanders, one of them, they speak Dutch, right? In Wallonia, another one of them, they speak French. And in Brussels, they speak French and Dutch, okay? And somehow, this national team, this men's national team, achieved the number one ranking in the summer of 2018 with just 26 professional teams in the entire country. Context is, there are 72 professional teams in England alone, okay? So, They've also got dudes you know. It's one of those where people that watch professional soccer, especially in Europe, would look at the Belgian roster, especially over the last eight years, and be like, they have who? Because basically since 2014, they've been in what is called a golden generation, where they have this tremendous group of talent that is about the same age. And at one point, it's Marion Fellaini, it's uh, it's Thomas Vertonghen, it's Eden Hazard, it's Romelu Kakaku, it's Thibaut Courtois, and it's their talisman, Kevin De Bruyne. Okay. They still got a bunch of those dudes on the roster. And this is their last, I think, real shot to win a major trophy with this golden generation. They're not supposed to be this good. They're not supposed to be able to compete with Spain, Italy, England, the Netherlands. Like, they're not supposed to be able to do this with Germany, okay? And yet, that is exactly what they're doing. And when you look at Clemson, you see the same thing. Like, Clemson has a full-time population of about 17,000 people in the city of Clemson. And most people can't even tell you where Clemson was before they started winning national championships in South Carolina, okay? And it wasn't even a squad in South Carolina. My man Javion will be the first person to tell you that. And then Dabo showed up. And having never been a coordinator, becomes a head coach and starts recruiting his behind off. So you had dudes, not just Deshaun Watts, Trevor Lawrence, Travis Etienne come through there. It's also Justin Ross. It's also DeAndre Hopkins. It's also Sammy Watkins. Like, it's CJ Spiller. Your face melts because you're going, all these dudes went to Clemson? And now they got defensive dudes, you know, because we can talk about McKenzie Alexander and Isaiah Simmons. But now we can talk about Brian Brzee. Like, they're not supposed to be this good. And yet they have won two of the last five national championships. It's the comp that I'm most sure of, Belgium and Clemson. Okay, college football fans look at France and see Ohio State. So 2014 Ohio State for me is a lot like 98 France, where all of these dudes on their squad, for the most part, for the most part, not all of them, for the most part, are islanders, right? They come from islands that were colonized by the French and not necessarily from France proper, like continental France. And yet, when you look at Ohio State, you see Urban Meyer, Ryan Day going into Florida, going into Texas, going into California to fill out their rosters, okay? When you look at the dudes that are actually making the magic happen, Justin Fields is from Georgia. J.K. Dobbins is from Texas, all right? Garrett Wilson is from Texas, all right? Like, Chris Olave from the West Coast, all right? You look at the dudes that matter, you know, you go to DeMatha to go get Chase Young. He ain't from Ohio, okay? I see the same thing with France. And France is also the favorite to win the Euros this year and should be right there to win the World Cup next year in Qatar. They also got dudes that you know about, you know, among them, Paul Pogba. I mean, all of a sudden, Olivier Giroud can start storing goals that he now ain't in an Arsenal uniform, but I ain't mad. <sighs> they got dudes, okay? France and Ohio State. College football fans look at Argentina and see Oklahoma. Now, there's a lot of different ways to go about this, right? Argentina arguably has the best player in the world in Lionel Messi. Oklahoma has had two first-round picks in back-to-back years, 
and has seen the last three quarterbacks that started Oklahoma draft in the first two rounds. So you can make an argument that, with some exceptions, the best player in the country could be Oklahoma's quarterback, depending on what year you want to pick. Okay. I know that I'm going to get a lot of Joe Burrow hate for that. I understand I'm going to get a lot of Justin Fields hate for that, Trevor Lawrence hate for that, all for that, but go with the comp here. It's also the comp because Argentina can't win a World Cup. Like, it's like, you look at that squad and you see Di Maria over there, you see Lionel Messi over there, you see Odomeni over there, and you're like, how is it y'all can't win the whole thing? They can get close. They can get to the semis. They can play third place, but they can't win the World Cup. It's like since Maradona, we're like, what are you doing? And is that not Oklahoma? Okay, we're talking about year 21 since the Sooners last won a national championship, but they played in the college football playoff three of the last four years. And they played for national championships like five times. (laughs) If you're talking about the playoff since 2000. Yes, so 03, 04, good grief, 08. Yeah, I can make an argument that Oklahoma's been played for a national champion or or been in the running for a national championship six times since 2020 or 2000. uh, Yeah, since 2000, which doesn't make me feel any better about this comp, but I think it's the right one. And then lastly, college football fans look at the U.S. women's national team and see Alabama. All right. So, like, I didn't really think it through when I did this on the Twitters, when I said Alabama is Brazil, and it's kind of a lazy comp, now that I think about it, but I thought it was good at the time. And I won't go into why, because I want to talk about why the U.S. women's national team is the better comp for Alabama. That team hasn't lost a single game since 2019. (laughs) That's more than 40 games without a loss and just one draw. Okay, look at that. Oh my, oh my, no, what? You're not supposed to have footwork like that. Look at this. There are three women around her. Look at this cross. Settle it, compose, finish. Goodness. Carly Lloyd, my God. She's 38 years old, man. She is the oldest woman to score a goal for the U.S. Women's National Team. She's the greatest women's soccer player that we've ever produced. You see how the Alabama comp works here, all right? Like, we're also talking about the Swedes being the only team to get a draw out of this U.S. women's national team, and that was last April. And they celebrated like they won the World Cup, okay? It's that big a deal to get the draw off that team. Since 1991, they played in eight World Cups, won four of them, including the last two, from March 2008 to November 2014. That's better than six years. These women were the world's number one ranked team. In 2014, they beat the DR, that is Dominican Republic for the uninitiated, 14 to zero, and were counting by ones. Alabama, 13 and 0 in 2020, six national championships since 2009, Nick Saban being the greatest of all time. They have Heisman finalists after Heisman finalists after Heisman finalists. We're talking about Johnny Rogers, Tim Brown, Desmond Howard and Devontae Smith being the only wide receivers to win the Heisman Trophy. And he just did that. And he wasn't the best wide receiver on that team. That was Jalen Waddle. And you can make that argument anytime you want about Carly Lloyd. I'm going to fight you about it. because. But if you look at Rose Lavelle, who is splitting defenders like orphan children, you might think differently. And I'm not going to fight you. Okay? You might look at Becky Sauerbronn and be like, RJ, that's the GOAT. And I'll be like, Michelle Akers much? You know, I keep going here is my point. And that's what we can do with Alabama. So I'm very proud of that. So I take it back. If Belgium and Clemson is close, the one that actually fits is Alabama and the U.S. women's national team because they're the only thing that has been close to as dominant as the U.S. women's national team. All right. Now I want to take your replies to my take on the top 10 college football players of all time. So now in the We Out Cheers segment, I want to welcome in S.E.C. Catherine, a.k.a. Produce Cat, to give me your takes on my all-time college football top 10 list for which there was wild, and the term is in the industry, engagement, because y'all were upset and in your feelings. Matter of fact, 
Hey, producer Cat. One of the things I was actually listening, uh, looking, looking at, and thought about because you know I hosted National Sports Talk Radio and I like doing Sports Talk Radio, and this is kind of Sports Talk Radio. Nobody is ever listening to the Sports Talk Radio host and saying, you know what, he slash she makes a really good point. Never happens. Never once happens. It's always you don't know anything about anything, and I'm like, okay, well, glad my bosses think that. <laughs> Meanwhile. Let's hear what your best was, because some of these I'm sure are good, especially judging by the response that we got to the show account and to my Twitter account. So producer Kat, what do you got? All right. You're going to have fun with this one. Okay. So this is from at CFP four underscore us. So I still need to listen to the latest number one show episode to hear your thought process, but AP has to be on my top 10. I would bump Baker out of the 10 you have listed and AP takes his spot. Okay, so there are a number of things that need to be addressed in this reply. And not all of them are going to make you feel good, CFP, because CFP is definitely a burner account. And uh, burners are for cowards. But to address your take in there, I can't get to it. I can't get to it because I can't get past who is AP. I don't know him. Matter of fact, I do know him. Are you talking about Alan Patrick? Do you think Alan Patrick should be on this top 10 list? Hmm? Or are you talking about the Associated Press? Because the dude that I know is A.D. You know, like Jesus. All day. Okay? Adrian Peterson's name is A.D. Because he is here carrying the rock, giving you the business, all day you also clearly are giving me a take before you are receiving a take like this is a fundamental when we're talking about dialogue and discussion okay this is also the part where it shows that i'm an english professor you know with a emphasis on creative nonfiction and french philosophy because dialogue and discussion is big part of this so you got to hear it, you got to listen to it, you got to receive it, and then you give it a close reading. And clearly, you didn't read anything that I wrote. I wrote 3,000 words about this. I spent an enormous amount of time talking about this. And I mentioned Adrian Peterson in it, for which, you know, you got points for this. But I can't put him in there because, A, I wrote down the criteria, and one of the criteria is, Did you win a national championship? What'd you do in winning time? Okay. Adrian Peterson got destroyed in winning time. And I'm not happy about it. Okay. 55 to 19. Remember that? I remember that. I remember that. Okay. So there's more to go on here. But I tell you what. First, put your name in your burner account. Second, get his name right. And then third, read the story and give me another take. We'll see what you got. What do you got left, Produce Cat? All right, this one is from at Big Quan Don. Archie Griffin is literally the only player in college history to win two Heismans. You wild for this one. Big Quan Don, related to the bishop, I'm sure. You know, I'm, I'm sure. Just be out there on the street, proselytize and let people know. All right, so I got a lot of people giving me some hate over the Archie Griffin being left off the all-time top 10 list, to which I say, A, you didn't read the story either because I go on at length. Matter of fact, the open to the doggone episode is you cannot trust the Heisman when you're doing this. It is a data point. It is not the point. Matter of fact, that is the greatest piece of propaganda ever in the sport that the Heisman Trophy is definitive. No, no. Matter of fact, the thing y'all tell me y'all love most about this sport is that it's not definitive. The thing y'all tell me y'all love most about this sport is that you get to argue over it. And that, hey, strength of schedule matters, knowing these kids can't pick their damn schedule, right? But, you know, let's say strength of schedule does have to matter. Did Archie Griffin win a national championship? Negative. Negative. And that second Heisman that he won, you know, damn well he shouldn't have won it. 
You know, one NAS championship in 1975, my Oklahoma Sooners. You know, the best player is on that team, dude by the name of Lil Joe Washington. Okay, Mr. Silver Shoes himself. Okay, man averaged five yards carry. Didn't get as many attempts as he did his junior year when he went for 1,300 yards on the ground. All right, I'm telling you, you got some problems here that you got to figure out because you're also trying to tell me that Archie Griffin is one of the 10 best players in college football during the 70s. Earl Campbell, I might let you have. Billy Sims, I might let you have. Archie Griffin, I'm not going to let you have. You don't get that one, dog. Uh Uh-uh. Matter of fact, I can keep dunking on Ohio State here, but I don't want to because I love y'all, and I like having you listen to the show. But if you're going to come at me with Archie Griffin, before you read the story about how I can't really talk about the Heisman, and then all you can say is the Heisman, we got a problem, okay? Because there are dudes on that list that you could include that did not win a Heisman trophy. But you ain't include those dudes. Like, ain't nobody coming at me talking about Gordy Laudel. Ain't nobody coming at me talking about Charlie Ward. Uh, well, he won a Heisman. Never mind. Gordy was a finalist. But you ain't coming at me with Charlie Ward, who also intercepted a pass while being the punter for Florida State his freshman year, and then was drafted into the NBA after winning the Heisman Trophy as a quarterback at Florida State. You ain't do any of that. Okay. I would even let you come at me with Eddie George, but you ain't do that. You came at me with Archie Griffin and two Heisman, which is lazy as hell. And one thing you're not going to be listening to this show is dumb or stupid when we're talking about college football because you're a smart listener. You're extremely smart. You're listening to this show, man. You know that I'm not playing stupid out here. You know that I'm not giving you the same wash takes that somebody else might that doesn't actually view and like the sport. So if you're going to come at me, come correct, because I'm always going to come correct to you, because I love you. So show me some love, and don't give me no Archie Griffin, no two Heisman. All right. SEC Catherine, produce Cat, what do you got? I'm going to try my best pronouncing this handle. Mm. At Pizardenita. Sure. The only correct answer is Paul Blake, but I wouldn't argue too much if you listed Joe Kane or Alvin Mack. This man understands. This man gets it. I'm saying, man, it might be a woman. This person gets it, okay? And the reason they get it is they know I love those movies. They know that that's where I live. They know I got the Paul Blake jersey on doing this show. Paul Blake, 30 years old, hadn't thrown a football in 13 years, getting recruited off the farm, shows up on campus, gets handed the starting job, galvanizes the team, beats the number one ranked Texas Colts going both ways. Well, he don't go both ways. They go both ways, okay? You can talk to me about Joe Kane and Alvin Mack. Alvin Mack also won Dwayne Davis, whose child, Wyatt Davis, was an Ohio State offensive guard and just got drafted last year. Shout out to him. Dwayne Davis also could be on this list because he's also Featherstone in Necessary Roughness. So he is an All-American linebacker in the program and a go-both-ways wide receiver with stone hands for the Texas Armadillos. I love that. Don't throw it to stone hands. And he's having to convince people that he's going to go catch the ball. But I would not put any of those dudes on this list. I would, however, include Andre Krim on this list because I'm an Andre Krim stan. Okay? Andre Krim. Andre does not eat raw meat because Andre is a vegetarian. Eat whatever you want, Andre. And he taught chemistry. That's my kind of dude. You can teach chemistry and be a dominant defensive lineman with jokes, okay? Like, you got my man over there. I forget who he's playing for. I think it's the Bobcats. But he over there, uh, the Doverman. Remember that dude? They got a black dude barking in this movie, y'all. Like, And then they called him Doverman. I'm not saying it. I'm just, you can see my face. Anyway, you got the black man barking and then you get Andre Krim played by Sinbad going, bad doggy. And I'm dying because that dude is also on the sub side talking about 
the prisoners that they played against. Because I remember uh, some of y'all remember the prisoner scene. So Cat, the prisoner scene got Herschel Walker in it, got Evander Holyfield in it, got Jim Kelly in it. And Jim Kelly's playing some linebacker talking about, all right, Dillos, let's get it on. Yeah. And I'm like, woo wee, right? And Andre Krim is lined up across with you dudes talking about, hey, fellas, I feel a little love. I feel a lot of love on this field. <laughs> you know, let's hug it out. And they're like, no, they punch people in the face. I love that movie. I love Andre Krim. I love Paul Blake. I love Featherstone. Oh, man. Joe Kane ain't going to be on this list. Joe Kane nearly got his girlfriend killed trying to go flying over them, them, them cement bricks and stuff. Talking about, I'm going to stop it right before here because I like to go up against the ragged edge. Fool. Man, my first vehicle was a motorcycle. I hate that scene. I hate that. That's also Harvey from like Pretty in Pink or Hardy. That's his name. Hardy. Can't stand that dude. Can't, I mean, great actor. Can't stand the characters he plays. They get on my damn nerves. All right. And then we can talk about, you know, my man Omar Epps and the football and him trying to go get Halle Berry, I ain't mad at him. I'm just saying that you can't be fumbling the football and hollering at Halle Berry. It's not going to work. I keep going. I should probably stop. <laughs> Look, I'm having a good time, as you can see. This show is a lot of fun. It's going to be a lot more fun come the season. We're coming up on media days. We're finishing what is a tremendous recruiting period in the month of June. My thanks to Bruce Feldman for joining the show. Chris Cheshire directs the show. SEC Catherine, producer Cat, a.k.a. Catherine Donnelly, produces the show. Kristen Scott executively produces the show. And Javion Duncan is our social media maven. I am RJ Young. We will see you next week. Doses.